I'd like to welcome everybody to the Wednesday, May 8th, 2019 Public Works Committee meeting. Roll call, please. Chairman Lockmiller. Here. Alderman Leahy. Here. Alderman Tice. Here. And Alderman Weggie. Here. Move on to item number two is approval or amendment of the agenda. Anybody have any amendments? Can we go ahead and approve by acclamation? All right, so be it. I don't see any announcements or proclamations or recognition, so we'll move on to citizen comment. Anyone from the audience like to come up for three minutes and tell us anything you know? And I see nobody coming, so we'll move on. Reports uh, from the committee chair and aldermen. I have uh, a couple of things. One, I would like to welcome Nancy Parker Tice to our little committee here. And uh, we decided on possibly changing our meeting time. And BOLA is the second Thursday at six, at six here. All right with everybody? Yes. We don't, do we have to vote on that change? I don't think so. OK. Um, we do need Shelly. I am um, on the uh, our city calendar. It looks open, but we just need to confirm with the school district because we're going to move them over there during their renovation. Oh, okay. So this is perfect timing. Janet's actually compiling the list right now. But when would you know? I would say probably tomorrow. Okay. So you could just let us know by email if that's okay. going to work for everybody. Um. I think that's all I had. Uh, Alderman Leahy? No report, your sir. Alderman Tice? Good, Alder uh, Woman Tice, I'm oh, sorry. That's, that's the first time we've had somebody. Well, that have a means has three women. Um, I have a question. At what point do I ask a question of you can ask staff? Can I, is that appropriate yes, to do yes, now? Yes, during report. So I, um, this is sort of a combo question for Eric and Dan. Um, so we have a resident in our ward who has a lateral sewer and there are roots in the lateral sewer and I know it's not approved by their, by our policy to fix that particular part of the lateral sewer and the resident is aware of that. Um, they're concerned that the roots that are there are from a city tree closer to the street. So my question is, when we plant city trees, is there any attempt to be aware of where lateral sewers are joining in at the street uh, when city trees are planted? Eric, you going to take this one? Yeah, happy to. Uh, what we try to do is find the lateral and plant a tree right on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Good um, root system. No. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, it's been a long week. Is it, is it Thursday yet? No. I, I apologize. Uh, what we do is uh, our guideline says, uh, says that we'll plant a minimum of six feet away um, from a lateral. What we try to do is try to keep further, keep them further away as possible. What our arborist, our uh, urban forester tries to do is go, uh, what we try to do is nine to 10 feet is what we commonly do. Uh, but we also have to look at driveway clearance, things like that as well. Um, with that being said, uh, the um, tree roots will, will grow and, and they seek out water. Um, I, did, uh, I did talk to my urban forester about this, this one in particular. Uh, what I will say is the trees um, on uh, at this address were planted before we, we took over, so we can't talk to those trees in particular. Okay. So I, I am not at liberty to say where, you know, when those trees are planted, where, why they're planted at those locations, but we do try to stay six feet away from them. Um, it is it is possible for trees in the backyard, their root system to get into laterals in the front yard. I mean, that, that is the nature of tree roots, but uh, we do try to stay at least six feet when common is more nine to 10 feet. So that is what we, that is our, our policy. Good, okay, thank you. You're welcome. No report, but Nancy, congratulations on getting sucked into the sewer lateral morass so quickly. <laughs> oh, it's only been like three it weeks. It didn't take with, long. With no, the no, rest no. of us. Spend the rest of your time talking about okay. it, trust me. Program that keeps on giving. Okay. Oh, come on. If you can't have one word. Oh, then, Lee, I think I passed over you. Who? Did I pass over you? No, I had no report, no. sir. Okay. Odd as it can be. Bola, city administrator report, anything? I have no report. Uh, department report, I believe we have a presentation from Dan uh, regarding our fleet. 
And I think we will be moving our meeting out of doors. By this. Before um, Dan speaks, if it would, if Eric could come up um, at your pleasure to provide a brief update on the RFP for the surveying project. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as, as you know, we put out an RFP for survey services throughout the city of Brentwood, and we had. Basically, as we started, we were putting out an RFP for two locations. It, uh, it ballooned to eight. Uh, it, since then, we've had um, additional two to three different locations that uh, either the, the current mayor or some other people said, hey, could we add those to, those, uh, to that RFP? Uh, and so obviously, there's a need for, for survey services um, from time to time, obviously. Uh, the RFPs have come back. Um, we've gotten, uh, we got, seven responses. So we got, we got a good turnout for those responses. Um, Dan, Lisa, and myself reviewed those responses. Uh, we got a range of um, fees anywhere from about $55,000 to $117,000. Uh, so it is, is a wide range. And, and the, the real thing is you looked at, we also asked for a, a, um, a scale of, of um, uh, scale of uh, prices, uh, hourly prices, breakdown of hourly prices, and those were all very similar uh, for your one-man crew, two-man crew, project manager, things like that. So the big difference were the hours of uh, what people were putting into each project. Uh, so at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in uh, a number of uh, a number of the, uh, we broke it down to about four, uh, four uh, companies that we'd like to bring in for interviews. And one of the big questions that we're going to ask is their hourly breakdowns and why their hourly breakdowns are a little bit different. Uh, to be to be completely honest, uh, we don't have the, the full amount for for to do all the projects. So well, that's another thing we'll talk about is you know how we're going to uh, take a little bit of a um, how we're going to uh, um, prioritize some of those. And then at the same time, we'll probably work, uh, if, if the committee thinks it's a, a good idea, which we hope they do, is work on um, a little bit later on in the year an RFQ for having an on-call survey services so that as we can next year budget for this, and then as from time to time other things come up, we have a, a couple companies on hand that we can have these prices already uh, put together. So that is our, that's our plan uh, moving forward. So uh, that's what we'd like to do. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll move forward with some of these things. Questions for Eric on this? I think an on-call service is, is what's needed. I mean, this seems to come up every once in a while. And yeah. instead of having to go through RFP, it seems like a smart move. Yeah, we were hoping maybe to kind of tweak it to go to an RFP, but darn that city attorney and doesn't want to, wants to make sure we do things the proper way. And, and obviously it is, it's, it's what we have to do. So uh, to do a couple this year, I know the uh, the Bridgeport White Trail is one that we really want to get done because that's kind of one an important one that's out there. So that's one that we want to make sure we get done, and a couple other ones. Obviously, the uh, the swim club is the one that's going to cost the most, and that's the probably one we want probably will not need to be able to get done. We'll probably have to budget for next year, and it might be the first one we can do with the on call. And we should have at least the, the RFP part hopefully back to this committee in June. So for the ones that we do and our recommendations on the priority of the ones we can do. So thank you. <coughs> Dan then. And... Dan has a PowerPoint presentation that's in board docs. And we thought maybe we should share that with the audience, but um, it's available on the website so we can either have Dan just run through his presentation, then we can go outside for the tour. It's, it's up to you.
guys have, well, there we go. Uh, the same presentations on uh, board docs. If you click it, it should open up. It's PowerPoint. And then there's also the uh, little bit of other information in there. And when all else fails, I made a uh, paper copy. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually completed uh, for ways and means just um, so if you open it, if you, you know, I know Rick's getting it prepared, but if you did open it, it was actually um, the intent was to go over both parks and public works. So there's parks and recs ve vehicles as well as the uh, public works. I don't know if you want me to start going through it or wait till he pulls it up. No, I think we can. Yeah, it should be the. Oh, what's, what's the name of it? It's a PowerPoint. If you go to like date modified, it's today's date. Very top one. Let me double click. That's yeah. no, I can actually page down to that. Oh, that's fine. Get, uh, I'll tell you when to stop. It should say public. Just tell me when to the advance. slide number eight. I've got the, um, the numbers in the lower uh, slide. All right, now we're all on the same page. Um, so slide eight was just to give you a, an executive summary of what we actually have with Public Works. So Public Works has fleet for several purposes. We have a sanitation department, so there's four uh, sanitation trucks. So We'll uh, take you to go see a garbage truck up close and personal. It's out in the parking lot. That's one of our large ones. So there's three large ones, and then there's one small one, which is a F-250 with a small hopper on the back. But these that you see do the majority of what we uh, need for collections, whether it's yard waste uh, on Wednesdays, which was today, or recycling on certain days, as well as uh, regular trash. Uh, sewer department, we have an ambulance. That's not here. It's back at the shop. It's actually a repurposed ambulance. It was a real ambulance in its former life, and then it's been converted over to haul closed circuit TV and different sewer tools. And then we have for our street department, there's a street sweeper, which is out here, chipper truck, that's back at the shop. We have um, three categories of trucks. There's light duty, which would be like your F-150, which is a half ton truck. We actually don't have those. We have three quarter tons, so we have F-250. Then we have the medium duty, which would be like your one ton trucks, uh, some with dump beds, some without. And then a heavy duty truck, there's one of those heavy duty trucks out there, which is a two ton, that's truck 56. And then um, these are used for different um, tasks, whether it's hauling materials, hauling a trailer, sometimes 56 is dutied with hauling the band stage, uh, Parks uses it, you know, we sometimes share each other's vehicles during snow routes. Um, so this is just a real broad brush of what we have under uh, eight. And then if you click to the next slide, nine, make sure. This I did for my own sanity just because I was trying to figure out, it's like when people would say a number when I was first here, I didn't know well, what is 52 or what is 55. It's like they know it because they've used it. I've never driven it, you know. So what I tried to do is based on our policy of how we organize things and how we replace them, that's what this is. So over on the far left is the ambulance. It's a 1997 International. And the reason why I color coded them and broke them up was because each one has a special purpose. So you've got the ambulance. We don't just drive unless it's a sewer job. Then there's the group of four trash trucks I talked about, sanitation one, two, three, and four. There's the street sweeper, which is 72. There's the chipper truck, which is uh, 59. And then the light duty trucks, which would be uh, the Ford 250. So you see those 54, 47, 62. And then the medium duty. So you have the 68, 75, 76. 76 is the one the engine failed. So it's still sitting there. Um, we probably, in fact, I know it's in the capital budget to be replaced. 
we can probably just sell it and then whenever we get ready we'll um, you know take that money and use it towards something new because they told us it would be probably twelve fourteen thousand dollars to replace the engine it's a v10 engine Ford no longer makes it you'd have to put in another v10 and it's a lot of money for an 05 truck um, and in the last category, the group over on the far right, there's six large duty trucks and you'll kind of appreciate their size when you see that up front and personal. Um, so of that six, several of those get used for snow routes of the medium duty. Those get used for snow plowing as well. And then the light duty, they don't have any plowing duty, but they haul staff around. I think you have a question. Will you take questions during your presentation? Want to do uh, them at the end? The uh, well, what's ever easier for you, Dan? If you're it doesn't matter this. if you have a question now while it's fresh. Is your color coding also reflecting which driver's licenses are necessary? I know you mentioned in your report oh, it, that you had some does, CDL. Can, yeah, I can which tell trucks you. are limited? Just the trash? Uh, trash is a CDL. The 72, which is street sweeper, is a CDL. 59 is a CDL. That's a chipper truck. The ambulance is a CDL. I guess it'd be easier. What doesn't use a CDL would be your light duty trucks and your medium duty, unless they're pulling a trailer and then it might bump them up to the CDL yeah. status based Thank on Thank you. Weight. But okay. the stuff on the far right and then the brown and the reddish brown. And your large, and in okay. Green. Thank you. But yeah, that's what that was. And I, I only color code them for my own you know, visual aid to help myself whenever I was looking at them. So those are the trucks kind of um, in a nutshell. If you want to forward to the next slide. I know we kind of went over this for uh, slide 10. But in slide 10, it, uh, again, it talks about we have 19 vehicles. Truck 76 is out of commission. Um, 76 is a spare medium duty truck. It was scheduled in 2017 for replacement. Uh, we did not replace it. And then the lack of that truck leaves us with just two medium duty and zero spare. And it was all, 76. By losing it, it also uh, lost a dump truck bed. You know, it wasn't just a conventional bed, it actually had a dump bed. And then of those 19 vehicles, we already saw on the chart, four dedicated sanitation, uh, 48 is dedicated sewer, 72 is a sweeper. And then of the 13 vehicles for streets, 76 doesn't operate, 59 is a dedicated chipper truck. So if you go to Public Works, it's got the big wooden boards on the side, the uh, brush bandit, which is the chipper that's being towed behind it, shoots the chips of wood right into it. So we can grind up Christmas trees or parks can use it if they're clearing brush. Uh, so that has a special use. And then in here it says uh, six trucks are large and limited to CDL drivers. Those are the ones on the far right. 76 is the only vehicle that we use for towing the bandwagon based on its uh, frame and transmission. Back up. Okay. I'm on uh, slide 11 now. So if you want to fast forward. Uh, 11 is just kind of the challenges that we face. So again, 76 has a failed cylinder. 48, it really only serves the purpose of sewer lateral. And if, if we're going to continue with sewer lateral, I'd rather see it replaced with a truck with a tool bed. Um, 59 is the chipper truck. 71 is very old. It's a 1994 GMC. So it's used as a spare spare. Uh, it's difficult to source parts for it since it's 25 years old. And then 56 is used uh, for towing the band stage. And then Sanitation 1 is a 2013 Freightliner. When this was written, it was scheduled for replacement in 2023. That would be its 10 year mark. Um, in the budget, I believe that it's 2024. In fact, I know it is under our five year adopted, uh, or under a five year capital in the adopted budget. Sanitation 2 is a 2011 Freightliner. And there's no dedicated pool vehicles. It's whatever the job is. I typically drive my own car, so does the project manager, because there's not any spares. If you look at that table, there was only three regular sized trucks and then three medium duty, but only two work. So there's really only five that people traditionally use over and over. Because you're typically not taking the really large dump trucks out to job sites. They're very specialized. Unless you're doing a, a sidewalk tear out or something like that, then you would use it. If you want to jump to slide 12, uh, 12, again, it talks about 76. We're going to probably sell that on GovDeals this year just because the engine costs. You know, you really probably don't want to put in that kind of money. We did fix 75. 75 is, is a 
which is sitting out here, it's a four-door crew cab with the same V10. I know Ford had problems with the V10. They no longer make that V10 gas-driven engine. So it failed as well. It failed this year, and we did replace it because that one's five years newer. It's got a better dump bed, and it would make more sense to put that 12, 14,000 in it, which we did do, because now we really don't need to do much more with it. You know, it'll, it'll still need maintenance, but not like if you were doing a, a purchase of say 60 or 65,000 for a brand new one just like it. And then truck 71, uh, we talked about uh, getting rid of 71 and 56 together and getting one really nice truck that could be used to tow the bandwagon. It could be used between parks and um, public works. And then Sanitation 1 and Sanitation 2, we talked about possibly a lease program or maybe even the purchase of a demo or a used one rather than a brand new trash truck because those are about a quarter million dollars. Uh, the sweeper is also about a quarter million dollars unless you go with things that are regenerative air, which typically are less than 200,000. That's what we have is regenerative air, but we'd like to go with a mechanical broom. And you'll see whenever we go out there, it's actually got suction lines and the brooms don't. You know, the brooms don't clog up because the brooms turn and they throw whatever into the hopper. This has 10 inch suction lines and if they plug up with pine needles or sweet gumballs or whatever, that's it. Shut it down, have to clean it out. So I think that might be it. If you want to forward to the next. Yeah, questions. So kind of went through it fast, but I wanted to still take you out before it starts pouring or we blow away in the wind. Dan, are, is there any grant possibilities on any of these vehicles? On the trash truck, I'm glad you asked, uh, truck four, which is the newest, it's a 2016 Mac. We did get a grant before I started, I guess it was 2015. Uh, it was a little over $70,000 and that was through the uh, St. Louis uh, Jefferson Solid Waste District. So we applied for it. You know, there's no guarantee you'll get it, but you should apply for it if that particular one was applied for for recycling. Granted, it's also used for other things, but it's rotated in the fleet primarily for recycling. If one of those other big trucks goes down, as long as you clean it out and solely haul trash with it, you can use it for trash, you know, or yard waste, and but you, you don't co-mingle it. If you lease a vehicle and it goes down, do they promise you a vehicle right away? I don't know, because we haven't explored that. I don't think so. But I don't know that. I mean, maybe we can ask that question if we wanted to consider it. You know, I can jot that down. I mean, we have budgeted $10,000, right. is that right, in the 2019 budget? Correct. So, so that in if case that of happens. an emergency, armor equipment, we could contact them. As long as they have one available, you have to rent it for $10,000, and it's for one month. But you can use it for the entire month. And I thought, well, if I had to do that, I would wind up sending each of the other ones out just to have preventative maintenance done to make sure there's nothing going wrong with them so that you return all of your fleet back to 100% or at least close to 100% what you can see that needs to be fixed. Yeah, if you want to, we can take the tour now, I guess. Or if you want to, we can... Don't leave your purse. Love paper. How we get the walking tour? Well, you don't want to walk. Yeah. Okay. Then we gotta wait. Yeah, I don't know if you want to. We can start here and then work our way out. Sure. We can do that. Down. Down, down, down. Yeah, you were just in here. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> Should be a mile. This is 72. This is the street sweeper. We only have one of them. It's got dual steering wheels. Uh, I know that side I saw had junk in it. Yep. Uh, the driver always sits here, which is opposite of what you would mm -hmm. think on you know, your regular car. And that's so he can see the curb as he's driving, you know, clean it as close to, to the curb as possible. This, I believe, I didn't bring my notes with me, but I believe this is a 05. 
So it's not scheduled for replacement in 15 years, which would put it at say 2020 or 21, it's further down the line, but these are very expensive. We did look at, or I looked at, either leasing one or buying the demo because the demo would cut it from like 250,000 down to about 200. Or like to pair actually, they farm out their streets with me, but then you kind of lose control and you have to tell them like which months to do and how frequently. Um, you know, if that's something we want to explore, we can certainly do it. You do an RFP. Size is one issue. Mm -hmm. We bought the smaller sweeping things with the parks department, I wrote your department, because there are some streets with cars on them that makes this difficult right. to get through. Can I look at a smaller size and... Yeah, we're actually looking at, the one we were looking at replacing this, this is regenerative air. Yeah. So it has a motor up front, regular truck motor that powers this thing. There's a power takeoff, but there's a separate engine for that suction of the hopper. So if this runs and that doesn't, you can't do any sweeping. Or conversely, you can sweep, but this thing won't move go you down, down the, the road. Street. So now, you also mentioned that instead of using a suction vacuum, you I would, would look, use mechanical work with it. So that yeah. that may change the costing mm -hmm. a little bit, or am I still staying in the ball? The part? mechanical brooms you can get slightly cheaper than like this, These which things. is okay. what I would look at. And those have a broom in the front that rotates horizontally, and then brooms on the side. So if it's sweet gum balls, it just whips it back into the hopper. There's water to keep the dust down. Um, we uh, use this also during Brentwood days we do. for the evening cleanup of all right. the trash and everything yeah, after everything gets moved. trash, whatever yep. is out in the parking and lot. Mary Magdalene, I think, got to use it for their picnic for their mm -hmm. parking lot, so they're open again on Sunday morning for yep. the church. Yeah, because with this, uh, again, there's suction lines on the side, but if a bunch of pine needles or leaves or whatever get caught in this, it stops the whole suction process. Yep. So mm -hmm. then the driver has to shut this down take this apart and take a broom handle and poke up in there and try to get the debris out. Uh, once it's full, they take it, dump it down at the Strassner yard and the dumpsters, hose out this hopper. We did have key equipment look at this. Um, since we always drive on that side, we didn't replace that broom. So if you're wondering why are there no bristles and there's bristles on the other side, since we only sweep on that side, it made no sense to spend the money to put one on this side when we would really never okay. use it. But this hopper part has like a gel coat. I don't know if we can see it or not, but I don't want to try opening it and <laughs> taking my fingers off. But the seal is shot on this gate or getting to the point yep. of being shot so it doesn't hold 100% suction like it used to. But on the inside, there's a coating that's over the steel. And over time, all that grit that's swirling around abrades that coating and gets you down to bare metal. So it's been re-welded in a couple of spots. Uh, you got some yeah. rust up here on the top. Oh yeah. yeah, but that's to be expected. You figure over five or six, mm -hmm. and if you want, we can go on that side is a when one you, ton. When do you think this would be a replacement? <coughs> I'll look whenever we go back in there, but I know it was every bit of fifteen plus years of age before. Okay. Yeah. Oh five. Yeah, I believe this is either oh five or six, but it's on the spreadsheet. And how much have you spent in terms of repair this year alone today? This one's not that bad. When I did that. Uh, analysis today it's about a thousand dollars but in the past we've spent more you know brooms you know a couple thousand but this year I'm crossing my fingers you know that it won't go much higher. Has there ever been discussion in Brentwood about not many municipalities if you don't park on a street on a certain day or you know, yeah, we, we had discussed got, about that and would that change the type of truck we would be able to use if there weren't cars to maneuver around? Well, the one thing we talked about, which is in our capital budget, is a, uh, a brush attachment for our skid steer. So the skid steer is that little mini excavator, um, our little bobcat. We would put a broom on that, and we'd be able to go like in tighter areas. So first they have to do the RP, and then we'll get it, and then we'll be able to implement that this year. And then this one, uh, we refer to this as the redneck limousine. It's a four-door. Uh, truck, so this is a one ton, I believe, yeah, no, a ton and a quarter, or two ton, no, ton and a quarter, because it's 550. But at any rate, um, four doors, usually we can take like four people to a job site, so if you're doing concrete work or whatever, everybody can go together, put the tools in the back. This one's also on snow duty, so it's got the controls here for controlling the plow blade, the spreader, this is your spreader controls. The spreader would sit back here, fill it up with salt. Um, what else? If you wanted to dump anything out, of course you got a dump bed. 
Um, this one, I think what else with it? Two way radio, uh, not a whole lot else to look at unless you got any questions on this. But this fits down all of our streets as do the light duty ones. And then when we go outside, we'll see the heavy duty, and then you can get an appreciation of the difference between this size and that size. This can be used for applying salt, but because it's smaller capacity, you'll run out of your salt a lot quicker. So if you're doing a Renwood or a high school, this may not be the one that you pick. You know, we've got them actually on the routes for a reason based on size. So I don't know if you want to look inside or sit inside if you, <laughs> you dust yourself off afterwards. <laughs> Because this was just used for a concrete job, and we didn't. I was like, "Don't, yeah." I was like, "Don't worry about it. It's going to go back on." And these Dude. guys generally pretty rough on these things. Well, I mean, they're getting in and out of mud and stuff. I mean, we try to at least once a week just take the shop back and vacuum out the sheets. You can or seats you can see we wipe down those. This one's getting worn, so we'll replace that bench. And then this is the one that actually has a new engine. And that the reason why we did this one is it's five years newer than 76. It's a four door versus a two door, so you can get more people in it. That uh, dump is in a lot better shape too. I mean, it's got a little bit of surface rust, but that can be cleaned off and repainted. The other one actually had a hole in it, you know, because it was, someone broke it. Either when, yeah, either when they lifted something on or off like the salt spreader. And we'll replace this obviously, but I don't know when it broke. It looks pretty fresh and it's bright <laughs> yep. colored. Could have used in the day over on Strasser, but yeah, yeah. Typically, they put these little sideboards up because they'll put like asphalt patch if we're doing potholing. They'll put that back here. That's why you see it's kind of blackish, like from uh, oil residue. Uh, they'll put rock in here if you're doing a sidewalk job. I mean, these it's not like a regular pickup truck bed. This you can take a you know front end loader and dump whatever in here. It's not going to tear it up. It's just heavy, heavy duty steel. Um, and then this one is even heavier duty outside. Walk out here and then we'll do the garbage truck last. Got it. Go ahead. Okay. Good. 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 One of these also has a first aid kit of fire extinguisher. I just happened to see it in the back seat. So we've got safety stuff in each one of these. So if you cut your hand, there's a first aid kit. Um, again, fire extinguisher for whatever reason. I don't think there'd be a fire. And then uh, this one tows the bandwagon. This is 56. So uh, this again, I mean, you can see it's a much taller uh, dump bed to it. So a lot more salt will fit in that spreader. And then as Bola pointed out, the front end, all you have to do is hook your plow onto this attachment. And then these are used to shine over the plow. And then the plow blade also has lights on it too. So we take this off, we put it on every fall, get everything prepped, they stay in the garage and we don't remove that until spring. So these just came off a couple months ago. But that's pretty much it for these. We haven't bought a new vehicle at all this year, so when people think that they're seeing a new public works vehicle, what they're seeing is a truck that we removed the plow off of, took it to the car wash, it looks new. Yeah, this, yeah, this is not new. It's not new. Yeah, if you want to look inside. 15 years on the larger ones, I believe it's 10. Oh look, it's in the highest. The sweeper and that were a little bit longer. And then we'll go way over here. Couldn't put him in the bag? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I asked the dumb question. I'm like, that won't fit in there, will it? He's like, <laughs> it does, but we were having to take the roof out. Yeah. Oh, right on. How are you? <laughs> I don't always bow, but what I, I do? I appreciate it. Yeah, very well. <laughs> All right, we'll open this one up. Kind of 
stinky, so. Yes. <laughs> This is a, is a garbage truck. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen them come down your street. Yes. Dan, um, the most servicing that you do on this truck is replacing brakes. Uh, no, or this the hydraulics a problem. This year, um, trying to think which of these two, it's on my notes laying there, but one of the two is either one or two actually had the air lines, the air compressor, um, hydraulic lines, power takeoff to the tune of over ten thousand dollars in one of them but the tires themselves they're usually like three hundred dollars per tire mm -hmm. so we'll usually replace the front too because that does a lot of wear and tear from turning and then we'll replace usually sets of four so you can see here you've got you know four and four so you've got eight so because it's so expensive you know that's usually like a group of fours about thirteen fifteen hundred dollars depends on price of oil and price of tires but usually we'll go to phrasal and get tires on it uh, the drivers, when they do their walk around, they inspect it and look for wear and tear. And we try to get as much life as we can out of them before we actually do replace them. So that's why we don't like your car. You would probably do all four at once, you know, or most people do. Um, or you do two. You know, you never want to really just do one on a vehicle. And then we can go around the back. These are, you know, you need at least a B-level CDL with air brake endorsement because these have air brakes. The sweeper has air brakes, but the other trucks do not have air brakes. Yeah, I know. So this is where the magic happens when you see the drivers. You know, it's got yard waste. We still have to hose it out. They just barely got done uh, before I told them to be here. So this will be cleaned out in the morning, and then they can do Thursday be recycled for this one. These are your cart tippers. So if you have a cart, they'll pull it, put it on this, hit the switch on the side, it'll pick it up, tilt it, slam it back down. These are what they refer to as rear pickups. Like Republic and others, they have the side pickup, so they're able to pick up from the side, use the pinchers, grab it, dump it in there. Some of them even have the front hoppers where the little robotic arm dumps it in the front. Driver looks down, sees his full, picks it up, and raises over. And then the other thing we use is like this cable and winch system. There's a dumpster over here at City Hall. We empty that, it hooks onto here. You put the cable on we'll and pull that. up and empty it. There's one at uh, Brentwood Park, and then Rec Center, I believe, has one. So we empty all that ourselves, and then depending on where it goes, you know, it could be going to Valley Park one day, and then, you know, I think it's either Bridgeton or Hazelwood for Republic. For, for recycling. Yeah, for recycling. So, again, these are rotated, and if this goes down, I mean, we've had, when we have two of these go down, that's when the worst of it is uh, for us, because we don't have enough capacity. You need at least two of these to get something done within an eight or nine hour window. If we have all three of them up, we can keep things under a normal eight-hour shift, you know, typically six or seven hours. How often a day do they have to go and dump and come back? It just depends. Like, yard waste is heavy now because everybody's got some grass, so it'll be at least one time, possibly two times, to the dump because it'll fill up. But in February, it'll just go the whole route, and then it might only be a four-hour day. Uh, and then like recycling the same way if it's like around the holidays there's a lot of cardboard paper it'll fill up quickly uh, trash same way you know people are cooking a lot more disposable and we continue but, to try to educate on what is appropriate to recycle right. um, because what everyone thought they could recycle before we now know we're really not good recycling items right. so we continue to educate about that do you want to talk about how much we've spent so far this year in terms of repairs on these trucks? Yeah, I know the sanitation in that chart I had, like, there was over 30,000 spent just in fleet, and that was just outside vendors. And of that 30, I think it was like 16, was just sanitation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've had some big ticket items go wrong. Because your air compressor, I knew we replaced airlines and a bunch of other uh, braking system to one of them. And then the uh, driver said it wasn't developing enough air pressure. And the way the air brakes work is the compressor has to be running, develop enough air pressure to push the brake open to allow the wheel to turn. When the compressor doesn't have enough pressure, the, the air brakes spring open and actually lock on and keep the thing from moving. So it's kind of a fail-safe. If the compressor's lost, you at least have brakes. 
you know, in a passenger car, if you cut the lines, you've got no brakes. You've got an emergency, and that's it. And that's the cable system. Do we have an in-house maintenance center? A guy that a mechanic in house for these. Our mechanic can do out. like the lines, like these hydraulic lines and stuff, like on this uh, blade, and he can do some of the minor stuff. But we can't do tires. We can't pick it up, and we can't do a lot of the other stuff, like air compressors. We have no diagnostic equipment that can read the engine codes either. This is kind of like your car will say service engine. I'm like, well, what can that mean? It can mean lots of things. And this is the same thing. We take it to Vanguard or truck centers or a couple other places. They'll read the code. They'll tell us what it says, and then they'll give us an estimate. So usually they'll say, oh, you know, your crankcase um, assembly is broken. It's like, okay. And then some of the things I didn't know because it's specialized, you know, these things have regen phases on them, they're diesel, they're turbocharged, and I know they were saying, well, you have to let that regen, and if you don't, the vehicle will just shut down until it regenerates the catalyst. Is this the one you want to replace next year? Uh, I'll have to look at the table. There's, I always get them confused. I think number one is a 2013 Freightliner, number two is the 2011. Okay. But obviously we'd want to replace the older one. It's got way more hours. That's the other thing, if you look at the odometer, you know, it's like, oh, that's not that bad. It's a little over 100,000 miles, but this thing is idling and idling. You know, it's Stop eight, nine speed. hours a day where it's like you move up 10 feet at a clip. You know, you wouldn't do that with your, you know, whatever you have, you know, Honda Accord or something. You wouldn't let it idle for eight hours. And, you know. One of the reasons why we're talking about this today also, as you mentioned, in the 2020 capital improvement budget, we want the committee and the board as a whole to start thinking about what the next plan of action should be. Um, it would cost about a quarter of a million dollars to replace one of these trucks in right. addition to the grant that we get. So I think the plan, if the committee agrees and the board as a whole, is um, if that's the direction to put that in the 2020 budget. Put it where, board? In the 2020 capital improvement budget. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, move it up. Move it up. Yeah. Okay. When will we start getting data on what percentage of the recycling is actually getting recycled? We have numbers that are, it's still the same way. We'll have to call Republic because we have a number of what was delivered. I've got that in the table. But of that, say we dropped off a ton out of this thing, you don't know how much of the eight ton was actually recycled. But don't we get reimbursed for what is successful? That's recycled? all I have. It's like we're charged 115, yes. but then it comes off that number. So we've been averaging between 91 and 92 a ton after they credit us back. So I can back into the math and try to figure that out using that. But they should be providing us with their report because yeah. we used to get that. How much of what we deliver um, was good recyclable. Right. Right. So they were providing that to us on a monthly basis. And then right. we generate a report and share it with the board and the public. We can ask right. for that. Right, because I yeah. think, number one, that would give close feedback to residents on how well we're doing recycling. Right. But okay. it could also change our plans. If it's only like 10%, then why are we wasting all this time and effort and money? Right to throw a bunch of stuff in the landfill and we need to fix Yeah, because I met with uh, U-City and Kirkwood and they said that they have Republic as well and whenever they get their credit back, they're less than us. They're like high 80s, like 88, 89. So that's what I'm trying to figure out is why we're paying like 91 or so and they're a few dollars less per ton. So it either means that they do a better job and whatever they recycle is more recycling or whatever was recycled where the steel aluminum because it's based on the commodity rate so whatever was in here if it's more valuable than say paper or something then you're going to get paid back for it. nobody seems to know like what's in a cart like of that cart is it eight percent glass is it this fraction of paper and then this fraction there's some you know data but it's not what i'd call like super accurate it depends on the area I think all the beer cans this town generates. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Yeah, glass is the one thing that weighs a lot, a lot, and then you're charged by the ton. So if you can just pull the glass out, you should, in theory, save money and then just put the glass in a glass recycle area, but we don't have that. But strategic glass will buy glass, just glass. They don't want to mix with paper. We do single stream. Because that's the other thing. It's like single stream is what everybody's accustomed to. Dan, at one point we discussed the potential of setting up individual collection bins. Right. To work what we're finding is our trash picking arrangement may not be the best. Can we go back and look at the option of doing a collection 
maybe you only collect cardboard and glass to keep those and everything else goes to trash, but at least you get something. Is it a viable way of at least looking? We can talk to St. Peter's. They do dual stream where they separate paper and then everything else is in a separate container. But the problem here is where would you go for like Brentwood Forest? They're already pinched on space. If you if you literally just set up one location, yeah. Brentwood, you're what? At most two miles from the set, uh, from thing? Right. So I go to two miles to drop it off at a specific location. If I'm really serious about wanting to recycle, that's a whole lot better than, yeah, let's just put it at the curb, the trash guy will get it. Yeah. Type thing. Yeah, because what we don't have is the land for like a mm -hmm. separate Mark, recycling. For a whole lot of land. Yeah. U City does, Kirkwood does. So Kirkwood residents can separate all their paper, not even put it at the curb, take it there to their recycle center. If we get Brentwood bound going, we might have some, some space. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's the conversation we have to have to find out. Is it like worth it? Is yes. Yeah. Is yes. it worth it? Right. Type thing. Or like the glass thing is interesting. Where my mother lives in Tennessee, they recycle everything except glass. And I couldn't figure it out. Well, yeah. the, the reason is glass color is heavy. Glass clear heavy and, and like, oh, yeah. well, now, now that actually makes sense. Because yeah. so, yeah. you can have colored glass. It used to be they didn't want colored with clear. And they said that that technology helps sorted. them sort it. They can add dyes. You know, the hardest glass they said to mix in would be uh, cobalt blue, but there's not that many things that are cobalt blue glass. You know, I can only think of a couple things. But, but like greens and clears and browns, they can all be mixed in. Yep, that's the last one. But yeah, we, that is, yeah, that's a skid steer over there, like those little bitty white ones. You know, ours is a bobcat. That's the brand, Bob, yeah. But we'll put a little brush on there. I'm gonna say who's got an ID. I think I need. Thank you, sir. here yeah sanitation truck number two went to truck centers at the beginning of April and that's the one it had like a u-joint a drive line replaced the air brake and compressor four thousand four hundred ninety eight dollars twenty cents and then that's the same truck it also had all of its airlines replaced as well and that was back in March 3rd so a month prior to that three thousand four hundred fifty eight dollars and twelve cents so that truck too is starting to, you know, see a lot of, and that is the oldest one I looked at that. So that's the one that's set for replacement. Yeah, and it's in the uh, capital budget. I know we actually did a, a separate vehicle report each department head did. So that was at Ways and Means. It's not in the packet, but it is at Ways and Means. Could you do, I'm a little bit confused as far as how much and when these things are going to be I know we just talked about the trash truck, but you've got some other vehicles on here. Is there any way you could just do a list of costs? Yeah, it's, it's in the capital budget. It was page 163 and 64 I took out of the capital uh, budget book. I just photocopied it this morning. So I know Public Works Streets, it's truck 59, and that's projected in the year 2023, and it's estimated at $91,000. And then... On the next page, page 164 of the adopted budget, it lists public work streets and then other vehicles to be replaced. So it has uh, truck 71, that's the 1994 GMC. Then it also has uh, truck 76, which is the one that doesn't run, and that one's 65,000. And then the sewer van, it lists 5,000, and that's really just for the tool bed. 
we were again trying to combine vehicles, get rid of three and have two decent ones. And then under public work sanitation, it says 2011 Freightliner, that's that truck two. Um, it's a 2011 Freightliner. It was originally supposed to be uh, 2021, but because of costs and things like that, it's actually kicked out to 2022 whenever you look at the uh, budget book. So it's $255,000 is what it's ballparked in 2022. And then lastly, the Street Sweeper, it is a 2006 Elgin. It is truck 72, which is out there in the fire bay. And it is 2023 and it's listed at 250,000. So it is all in the capital budget book. But the question becomes, if we're going to continue to do sanitation services, will it make it to 2022? Or will it need to go back to say 2020, 2021? You know, just so that you don't wait until it's completely dead. And there is a market for these, what I would say is uh, worn vehicles. There's usually like rural areas or, you know, sometimes farmers use these, you know, especially the ones with the dump bed. We had a guy, uh, he bought our truck 73 last year. He paid a few thousand dollars, but all he really wanted was the dump bed. He didn't really care about the rest of the truck. Mm -hmm. I mean, he got it, we got it running and he took it off the lot and, you know. It was his. Yeah, yeah he had <laughs> come here and paid the money and gotten the title and he was off. He was happy. Well, we just get the funds for all this for the capital improvements comes from the half cent capital improvement sales tax as far as Dan's equipment goes. That's correct. In addition to whatever grants we apply for, mm -hmm. but a, a, a majority of it comes from the capital improvement sales tax, yes. Then how do you guys distribute that among like police, fire? Each department submits a request based on a replacement schedule for each of these vehicles. So that's the basis for at least a start. And then we I, and Karen and I collectively look at the priorities during the budget process. And also we incorporate what we've heard from, um, from you, the elected officials. Um, but the conversation over the last year has been a growing concern from residents on how often the trash trucks are breaking down. So then that becomes a priority and we start to talk about whether we wanna move that up a year, which is why we're having that discussion and we know the cost right now um, quarter of a million. Also, we know that there's been conversation about the street sweeper, um, which is why Dan prepared the cost estimate of how much it's cost the city to, to do the repairs. So we factor all of that into the equation to determine what is an absolute this year, what can be deferred until next year. So it's a priority for each department and then how do we put all that together? Because obviously the police department has requests for vehicles. They're always replacing vehicles every year. <laughs> um, and then a fraction of their fleet is replaced every year. Then we also know that next year the fire department has the ambulance scheduled to be rep uh, replaced and we will be paying off um, that lease I believe early next year, and then the year after would come the pumper. Yep. So we look at all those schedules to determine what is priority and do we have to move anything up? Any questions for Dan? You need any action or is this just information and this is what we got coming our for way? For now it's information as we get closer to starting the budget process. Um, I hope that the committee has a discussion and kind of gives um, Dan some sort of direction, whether there's agreement to, you know, aff affirmation of yes, the trash trucks are priority. Um, and if funding allows, perhaps the um, street sweeper is, or maybe we can wait another year, or perhaps we can buy a gently used street sweeper that doesn't cost as much, but provides the same functionality. Right. I guess one last question, unless anybody else has anything. Is there any possibility of uh, uh, sharing equipment like this with other municipalities? Is there a, are you pretty much always out there in the field with every vehicle? Uh, for the sweeper or for other fleet? I'm just thinking. I mean, with the sweeper, that would actually make sense where you would partner with another city and one would do the capital and then have the guarantee that the others would want us for those services. Because then it would it would make more efficient use of that 
one person's time. It's like they would, you know, say, for instance, it'd be Richmond Heights and then say Maplewood, you know, you would make a loop through those two towns as well as here and that would keep somebody busy for a whole week and you would distribute that cost among those right. three entities, you know, us included. Because you're right, I mean, it's, you know, we're all buying the same thing to do the same thing, but we're only two square miles and they're not that much bigger than we are either. I know we don't, we're the only ones that do tra our own trash collection out of the three. Correct. But, I mean, the street sweeper could be that possibility and... Yeah, because DePere, I guess they did a cost analysis and they arrived at the conclusion that they only street sweep two times a year and they actually did an RFP where they competitively bid it, they hire a company, and then that company does it on the weeks and months that they want them to do it. Yeah, you could do that, but then you wouldn't have anything to worry about other than, you know, if the bids come in too high. But you could figure out what the bid cost was versus the capital outlay of, say, 250000 You know, how many... In other words, you know, how many sweepings could I get done for the same quarter million? You know, will that get you by for five years, six years? You know, I know that the lease they had suggested to me, at least, key equipment said they've got a demo unit. So they'll take it to trade shows, they'll take it to other cities. But because of the hour and odometer reading, they can't sell it as new anymore. But it's got all the warranties. It's just that it's been used a little bit. So usually you'll, you know, get a pretty good savings. He said, you know, if it's quarter million, you might get it for 200000 Okay. Do you, uh, I know we've... The sweet street sweeper is pretty obvious how much it's mm -hmm. utilized. Do we do a utilization report on other vehicles that we own and how often they're out, how often they're sitting? And um... uh, They're all, every single one of those, I should have mentioned when we were out there, they all have GPS. I mean, we could query the system that way because the system will tell you, you know, you can filter it by calendar, by day, by week, whatever you want to do. So you can see how, yeah. how often it was used during that time period that you're querying. So if you wanted to see what did the street sweeper do for the month of April? You can do that. I'll show the little vapor trail of where it's been, where which it's streets. Because that's how I look at, if somebody says, well, I had missed trash, it's like, well, were they really missed or was the vehicle not even down your street? And that's pretty typical if they're running slow because we had extreme cold or extreme heat or a vehicle went down, I can look and see that it has not even gone down whatever the street is. Say it's Swallow, we've only done a portion of Brentwood Forest. So I can tell the resident we haven't been there yet we should be there, you know, in a little bit. If it's still not done by, say, 2 p.m., call again because we're here till 3.30. And then we can give you another update. And worst case, if it's missed, we go to MyGov, we write a ticket, and we say it was missed. And then we go get it. So, I mean, we have other fail-safes in play. So it's like just because it got missed one day isn't the end of the world. We will get it. Hey, Dan, somewhat related. Are you still planning to put that schedule of sweets? street sweeping up on the we website. have it i need to give it to janet so i saw that on social media someone asked about it. it's like oh we have it i just i know we talked about it we've revised it with the operator i just need to give it to her so she can put on the uh, web page okay, okay. Let's do and then again with that oh, hopefully once we get the little broom we'll be able to get in those little niche areas assuming that people park off site on the day that they're proposed will you let us bola will you let us know when that's up there so we can okay. socialize yeah. yes I yeah will. yeah i'll write a note all right, thanks, Dan. Okay, thanks. Um, move on to the consent agenda. It's just the minutes from last month's meeting. Any changes? Motion to approve is submitted, sir. Anybody want to second that? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, we'll move, we have no old business. We'll move on to new business. Uh, item A is, Eric, this is regarding the 2020 uh, Brentwood Days cost discussion. Yeah, as, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'll try to make this quick. Um, the, we've been talking about uh, cost recovery for um, Brentwood Days uh, for a while. As you'll notice, this, uh, this memo was January 8th of 2018. So this goes uh, back a ways. And so the idea is that when we looked at this in 2018 is that uh, currently Brentwood Days loses a little bit of money. Um, and so we looked at uh, some ways that we could help reduce that net loss. And we came up with three ideas. Uh, one is that we could charge for carnival rides. And we could do it two ways. We could look at just charging non-residents. And there's two ways we could do that. Uh, we could just charge uh, wristbands. We could charge non-resident uh, wristbands. 
so basically we could tell the carnival ride operators that everyone had to have wristbands. So residents would have to come get wristbands um, prior to the event or down at the um, parks and rec booth during the event. And then non-residents would actually have to purchase, <coughs> excuse me, would have to purchase the wristbands during the event. Um, and, and that would produce a, a, some additional revenue for the, uh, for the city during the event. Now, obviously, that would be hard to track because we've never tracked resident versus non-resident usage. Uh, and there also would be some additional um, operational uh, difficulty, especially that first year. Um, you know, if you came down with your, you know, you come down with a neighbor and they didn't have money, those type of things, we'd be able to work that out. We'd obviously work social media. We'd be advertising a whole lot and make sure that people knew beforehand. And then, you know, we'd have to use some uh, some good judgment that that first year, first second year, to make sure people know what's happening. The second thing is, you know, we just uh, charged have the carnival ride operator charge uh, for rides, which is typically is what is done throughout most carnivals. Uh, we'd still have residents get uh, wristbands, so that way they still have free rides. And then the um, carnival, ride, carnival ride operator would then charge for uh, tickets for everyone else, for the non-residents. And if we did that, then basically the um, carnival ride operator would actually incur more revenue for themselves. We'd actually work with the uh, contract to then reduce what we are paying because we are paying a premium for those carnival rides to be free. Uh, what that would be, we'd have to discuss that. Uh, and then um, unfortunately it wouldn't be as much as if everyone was charged for carnival rides. So we wouldn't know exactly what that was. The second option was to charge everyone for carnival rides. As I said, if you go to any other carnival throughout uh, St. Louis, I'd say about 98.5% charge for carnival rides. Uh, I think St. Mary Magdalene, as we talked coming up, charge for all their participants for rides. Every 4th of July, every other festival, you go there, you'll pay a dollar for, or if not $2 for a ride, five for 10, you know, you pay the, the premium for those carnival rides. Uh, again, um, we would not see that, but again, we get a, a, a pretty decent reduction in the uh, cost of what we're paying for carnival rides to do so. Uh, the third option is that we can earn additional revenue through alcohol sales. Uh, as we talked about is that um, a lot of municipalities and a lot of festivals earn a bulk of their profit through alcohol sales. Um, we do not make any money on alcohol sales besides charging booths. Um, so our booths to fees right now, $150. Um, what we see is that we're basically helping nonprofits or those organizations uh, with their organizations by charging basically a pretty low fee for uh, a low fee for that. So things like the Golf Mall Post, the Brentwood Chamber of Commerce, Craft Beer Sellers, OB Clark's, they're basically, we're helping out our community by doing that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the city couldn't make more money if that's what we chose to do. So there's obviously different ways you could do that. Uh, a lot of places will have one beer seller that pays basically a premium to be that one beer or alcohol seller. So that's one way we could do it. Uh, the city could actually man our own alcohol uh, beer uh, alcohol booth. Obviously, that <laughs> require extra staff. There's obviously a lot of different things that go along with that. Uh, when I was working in Clayton, we actually had to help the uh, St. Louis Art Fair run their alcohol booth. It is uh, both fun and boring and tedious at the same time. Uh, and then obviously we can also utilize other organizations that uh, to run the booths for a donation, which again is what the, the St. Louis Art Fair does. So those are different things that could be done if that's what the city chooses to do. Again, I know we talked about in 2018 at the time it was decided not to do anything, but again, that's been brought up again uh, since then. So that is why it's before the committee today. I'll offer you another suggestion. And I understand coming from me, yes, we're losing money on Brentwood days, but I would offer to your booth people that if they had a participating float in the parade, that that too would get them a discounted price on their booth space. And it would help improve the parade and hopefully the neighborhood watching and then coming down to Brentwood days on Saturday. I think, I think it has merit to look at. And yes, okay. I'm cutting into the profits on booth rental, but I'm trying to improve the community's participation in, in our parade. Yeah. 
the options Eric's put in front of us. Anybody <coughs> want to discuss it, Brandon? I mean, this, this comes up every year. I mean, one thing is that residents are irritated that they have to wait in line, possibly for non-residents to ride the free rides. I mean, I, you know, Parks and Rec is not here to make a profit, and, and uh, this is our city party, and I think keeping it free for everybody is, is what we should continue to do. I mean, we make most of our revenue from sales tax from the region. Um, this is a way of kind of giving it back, um, and the fact we're losing money doesn't alarm me at all. And, I mean, the charging and residents and non-residents, in addition to just be, you know, just a pain and, and I don't know, it just seems onerous, to be able to do that it just doesn't seem in the spirit of of madden fest so i think we should just keep it the way it is i'll i'll chime in one more time you and i mr waggy both use the term losing money i think that's a misnomer i think the ninety five thousand is the city spending money on the residents that we serve I think it's a very good investment to increase the community's activity and the interaction between the city and, and the residents themselves. So I don't think we're losing. It's just an investment that I think we wisely are making. I, I know the crowds have seemed to have gotten a lot bigger over the year, and I think the word's out that this is a freebie. Everybody comes down and use those carnival rides really because of that i i don't i would be of the opinion to go ahead and just charge some type of minimal fee i don't know what do they charge at st mary magdalene for a ride it's 26 dollars for the ride bracelet for the two nights or the two days and i think it's 35 or 50 cents per person per ride if you don't have a ride bracelet to work with when we worked with the jc's down at the old Oktoberfest down at the Soldier Memorial, they were a buck a night, a buck a ride per person, and we were selling tickets, and the nights were the guys that sat in the booth selling the tickets to everybody to work with. But I agree, even if you go to charging and you choose to charge one group versus the other, you have not changed your lines. Those people are still wanting to get on those rides, so you're still gonna be waiting. So if you're gonna make it, you make it all for one. <coughs> so you charge everybody or you keep it free. Yes, if you make a charge per head, you do have the option in your contract to negotiate the percentage and stuff of what your carnival ride guys charges are. But I don't think we're gonna change that much drastically. Do you know the amount that it would potentially reduce if that's difficult to say. I mean, I mean, would we? Would it still be? Would it be? How much less of an investment in our community would it be? I guess that's, right. that's difficult. I mean, there's you know, there's the economic, you know, and you know, there's economic benefit of having people come in the city. You know, it's hard to yeah. say what that is. Um, you know, people are coming down for Brentwood Day, stopping at Walgreens to get water, stopping at Schnooks, getting you know something else before they come down. Um, so there's economic benefit to the city that, you know, you don't typically see in, you know, what we put down there. Uh, the, the other thing that's not in the, my, my memo is the, um, the staffing costs, which obviously we're paying overtime for police, fire, public works, park maintenance. Um, you know, that's just operational cost. Uh, you know, the, 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 the reduction, you know, it depends on the price point, obviously. So... It'd be it'd be hard to say without the seeing it my first year, but um, it, the the good or bad is it's a busy weekend. You got the balloon fest, you got taste of St. Louis, which is coming back downtown this year. Um, Green you know, Tree, yeah, Green Tree Festival in Kirkwood. Um, so it is. I mean, we are up against a lot of competition that same weekend as well. So I would make a motion to you know keep it the way we've always done it and keep it free for everybody. I'll second the motion. What, can we also discuss the alcohol sale thing? Well, you've got Golf Mall, and I want to say it's one It's one of the... Obi Clark's. Obi Clark's, but it's McGrath or Mark Twain that runs a PTO wine tasting and 
The optimists and, used to, and they've not done it in a while, but um, and then, the, the chamber uh, has a, a booth. Beer, um, we had five licenses last year, yeah. if, if I'm not mistaken. So, and the answer is, is those are helping your quote unquote nonprofits. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I would really encourage them. Keeping it free for the rides, yeah, you know, I got extra money in my pocket. Yeah, go, let's go get a, a bratwurst or something from somebody and I'll get a beer. You're encouraging the nonprofits and helping them. That's a wonderful thing. I was so, just hoping for free beer. <laughs> well, OB Clark used to give that to the city of people. <laughs> there was but a, they stopped doing that. There was a killer pineapple drink last time. Was that a nonprofit? Well? That, that was not. That's actually one of the restaurants. Yeah. So, they go. so is maybe we should differentiate on nonprofits versus profit, you know, because it's, it's probably. Yeah. And um, could, could we charge more for the for profit? Uh, exactly. Restaurants to come to to get a permit to sell stuff rather than the nonprofits, and then your dilemma with doing that is I'm the guy that's the businessman. Am I going to make that money back to work with? And the answer is, is maybe, maybe not. Especially if you're giving out five licenses. If you keep those food booths full with people in them, then your audience continues to come. But when you start losing. I can't feed them or give them drinks, your crowd starts falling off. And when that happens, then our city festival may not be as popular as it should be. One of the reasons why we thought perhaps the city staff could start selling is that we just had a, an event where um, on the day when it started, um, the, what is it, the beer seller was a no-show. So, and that just ruins it for everybody. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that would be an issue at Brentwood yeah. Days. I mean, we'll have plenty well, of there. We'll have plenty of there. Yeah. Yeah. But we're thinking about other events so right. that we're not experiencing the same thing over again. Yeah. Yeah. I would talk with the backstoppers. I would love them to spend time as a booth and offer their... They had wonderful food at the Light Up uh, the spring. And, yeah, it would hurt some of your others, but it's a good time to get, give them support. We have talked to them in the past. I think they're... They're at Kirkwood at the time. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're in Kirk. I honestly don't know the yeah. answer to that, but I think part of theirs is that they like being kind of the only show in town so that they okay. get a, a bigger return on their investment. But I don't think we want to cannibalize the nonprofits, right? Golf Mall, that's probably their most significant fundraiser of yes, the year. for them. And that really hurt them. That you know, yeah. it pays dividends through the year. So I don't think we want to do anything to damage their They are always giving a $101 check out to the groups that ask them for help. All right, well, motion is to keep it the same. Uh, let's take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you. There I am. Uh, where are we at now? You uh, lately. B. What did we just do? Yeah. Item B, I guess this is you, Dan. We've got a uh, bid on some hazardous material monitoring. Okay. This one's pretty straightforward. As you recall, we have the house across the street just to the east of the fire station. Uh, we are planning on doing demolition on that house this year. It's in the capital budget. Uh, but before we can do the RFP for doing the demolition, we have to vet out what kinds of materials that the house is comprised of. It was built in 1920. Um, so we had a walkthrough with a bunch of uh, environmental specialists. They noted that the siding is transite siding, which has asbestos-containing materials. There could be floor tile. There could be like some of the tape that went around the ducting downstairs that could have uh, asbestos-containing materials. Uh, there could be a few other hazards in there. But if it's lead paint, we don't have to worry about it because everything's going to be landfilled. It would be landfilled as specialized waste. But the abatement is something that definitely needs to be done if you have asbestos-containing materials. Uh, they'll test for anything that's hazardous when they do their walkthrough. Uh, we did have a walkthrough, and the uh, bids came back. Find the right page here. Yeah, we had, I believe, a total of five of them. Oh, here it is. And the St. John Environmental was actually the, yeah, St. John Environmental was the uh, lowest of those five. Um, so there's basically three categories. There's the hazardous material survey where they identify what is there and they'll report it. And then they give that report to us, which we include in the RFP for demolition. And then that way that contractor who specializes in demolition knows what he has to do with the abatement process. 
And then we'll also do air monitoring, at least an eight hour shift, because typically it'll take at least a day to uh, tear off the uh, siding. So that'll measure a baseline before they do anything. It'll measure it during the process and it'll measure it after the process is complete. And then last would be your closeout phase, which would be your documents that say that there's a chain of custody, that stuff was properly disposed of. And then we put that in the file and, and close it with the rest of the project. So their total of those three um, pieces was uh, 1,511. We asked them if the closeout was a mistake. They only put a dollar and they said no, that typically they don't charge to do closeout. They've not really seen a need to charge like the other ones did, which is just a few hundred dollars, you know, like three to 400. So uh, with the committee's permission, we'd like to approve this uh, low bid and advance that to the uh, board meeting where we would ask for a, a first and second reading at the May 20th meeting. Is this time sensitive? It is in the sense that we have to do this, then once they're done, which we hope would be in June, it goes into the RFP. The RFP is advertised, we would bring that back, we believe in July, you know, to this committee for the demolition. demolition. Okay. Then once the demolition bids are approved, then it goes to the board. What we're trying to do September is give ourselves enough we time. Tear anything yeah, down. It's like September, October, <laughs> because uh, the firemen want to use that for practice, which yep. is what they did with the house across from them on Eulalia as well. You know, they practiced, I know they used a saw and they cut holes in the roof and in the side and most of it I didn't understand, but I know they practice with other firemen from Clayton and local communities. So once they abate and remove all the hazardous materials, then they can do their practice, which typically they'll want 30 days to 60 days. The way it was written last, or yeah, last time, which was 2017 was 60 days. But you're wanting to do this in the form of resolution and within the consent agendas. Right, right, yeah, we'll actually do a resolution for the uh, May 20th the meeting to approve the contract. I want to make a motion? I move that we uh, accept uh, the bid from St. John Environmental up to $1,511 with a contingency of an additional $600. And a first and second reading? And a first and second reading okay. at the May... Well, or if it's a resolution, the consent agenda, it's not yeah. going to have a second reading. It's yeah. going to oh, yeah, it's just a resolution. Okay. Just oh, okay. Super. Second. Yes, one quick question. Here. Doesn't this fall within the new thresholds for the non, for the department heads to be able to go with the authorization? Well, we haven't brought that. Oh, we haven't right. passed that yet? Okay. <laughs> Disregard. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, Dan. Uh, our final thing on the list is with you, Dan, and yep. it is the asphalt of Swim, Club. Swim Park Lane. Yeah, and this Swim one, uh, I put in the history here just to kind of bring you up to speed. This uh, mill and overlay work was actually in our 2018 budget. It was roughly $35,000. Uh, the Swim Club, through a special assessment, I believe, at the end of 18 decided that they were gonna do improvements, redo the kiddie pool, parking lot, a bunch of other things. So they asked that we not do the mill and overlay of swim club, so we did not. So we took that credit and wound up doing some additional uh, mill and overlay work on Hatton. We did the uh, Nova chip over on Pine. So we did use that saving, so to speak, but we did not do anything with swim club. Uh, we did not put the mill and overlay in the 2019 budget, but rather it's out several years. It's around 2023. So since that time, uh, they've done their improvements. They're trying to do a reopening on May 25th, and they've got NV West under contract to do their paving of their parking lot. So the question that they posed to me was, well, could we just, since West was going to do it last year, West had won the contract. It was in their uh, uh, bid. Could they have West do the roadway at the original $35,000 cost? But we've spoken with the city attorney. We can't revive that contract. That contract closed. So we can bid it with the 2019 streets, which we've got a draft. I can include that as a line item, if you so choose, to get a revised quote for this. But by doing so, there's no way you'd meet the May 25th deadline. It would be after the swim season because I wouldn't try to jump in there between, say, May and September when they're using the road. And it's eh, maybe a little over 20 feet in width, and it's almost a quarter mile in length from Rosalie going north. So it's not really wide. And 
it can be done in probably a two to three day turnaround, but not this close of a turnaround, not if you're going up against the 25th and without a contract because we wouldn't be following our purchasing policy. Um, then there's some other questions that were brought up too as far as ownership. We've discussed that. I know Vola um, and I met with the city attorney and there's a whole legal opinion that was done, I believe, yeah, August 11th, 2007. So it went through, there's prescriptive easement rights, um, you know, going way back, you know, the railroad was there in 1899, eventually the streetcar was there. It was abandoned in 1949, and then that serves as the only ingress, egress out of the swim club. So it becomes an accessibility issue if no one does anything with it as far as maintenance. The legal findings does not obligate us to do any sort of maintenance to it. You know, the ownership, it, it, the ownership is pretty much all of us own it because all of us use it. It's open and notorious for the uses, the legal opinion that Mr. O'Keefe gave. So, you know, we use it to gain access to the trail system and do repairs on it or, you know, cutting trees off the trail. Uh, they also use it, you know, to go to the pool. You know, and our, our police and our fire would have to use it in the event, you know, unfortunately, if someone had an accident there or, you know, drowned or something, you know, they'd have to get back there and do life-saving services. So the only thing I could think, I mean, it's up to the uh, committee, you know, looking at it, if we don't have the ability to pave it, it's not in the budget. If you did want to pave it, again, we can do an alternate on the 19, but it's not budgeted, so then you would have to figure, that's why I put the table in there to include what is included in 19. Um, and once we get those quotes, or actual bids back, maybe some of those are less than what was projected, or we look to possibly defer something else for that savings if you choose to actually do it in 19 if that makes sense. So if you're still looking for $35,000, $40,000, then at what expense does it come f from the rest of the budget? Okay. Question? Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Bola, we could stick it into the streets for 2019 and do a budget amendment at the end of the year with the thought in the back of our heads that I'm going to come up with $35,000 to cover it, to work with. If we did it that way, we could get Norm West in there by the end of May, or that still is not a... That is still not possible because okay. the initial thought that we amend the contract we have we'll with take them time. from last year, yep. the city attorney thinks it's not a good practice. We don't have a contract this year we yet. We haven't gone out for an RFP for the street right. projects we have gotcha. this year. Thank However, you. we could ask the swim club... Um, cover the cost, and then when we go out, let's hope it's the same or less, um, and if there are savings, that, yeah. then we could we could reimburse them that, that. Well, that's part of what's in that legal opinion from Mr. Beinbeck, that when we hired him to do it, that the ownership is up for question. The city of Brentwood granted to the Brentwood Swim Club that they could initially pave that street in order to get to their club. It is since then that it has seen wear and tear and stuff that we are still taking it on. We use it for the maintenance of public right of way to go after. I would tell you that yes, you could ask the swim club. I'd be really hard pressed to see them say, oh yeah, we got 35,000 sitting in the treasury uh, type thing. I would tell you that I guess the best way I would look at is you're gonna amend and put it in your RFP for 2019, and we will get there when we have a successful bidder. And that way we cover it. That means not do it before this, we'd yeah, be in the fall. I don't, I, yeah, it could be as late as, late as the fall to work with. Um, the other thing, and I'm gonna bring it up for our education, we had in 2008, or 2000, yeah, October and uh, November, we had some resolutions to want to vacate the right-of-way that this is actually working through because there's a 50-footer instead of a 25 to work with. The city attorney at that time was um, Mr. Abernathy, um, Al Albrecht, thank you, to work with. He cautioned that unless we were physically going to survey where the street sits, 
in relationship to the boundaries that we hesitate to do any of that. When we do this mill and overlay, do we require that they have to do a survey or do they just mill and overlay because that's what's there in front of them and this won't create a problem? That's what they've always done. Like on any of our public streets that we know we own, we've never gone out and surveyed. We just, you know, say last year was Cecilia. It's like we just did Cecilia from Manchester going all the way up to Litzinger. So that will make that easier to get this project Yeah, and done. that's the way that this was bid, too. You know, we looked at it. I think it's like roughly 1,250 feet in length, and it's like 20-something feet in width. So the bid says it's over 30,000 square feet. Um, yeah, and then they give us a unit price per square foot. You know, what we could do, I know there's some pretty big potholes out there. I went out yes. there last week. You know, since we wouldn't be doing it, say, into the fall, we could hot mix asphalt those potholes. You know, you would saw cut out that huge divot and put something in there that's solid before the 25th. Yep. You know, public works could do that if you desire. Yep. That way it's at least more passable because otherwise... It's dangerous. I run yeah. through there. It's dangerous. Yeah, I know the winter was brutal to that thing. It didn't have that deep... And I know that they did a lot of work, so I'm sure that all that truck traffic didn't help it any over the winter. Sometimes their events are at night. That's yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Night. yeah. If, so that street was never... The city never took up any ownership it was never dedicated no the street has never been dedicated yeah. over to the city nor has it ever been vacated you are the greatest entity that can help maintain this street in a safe manner so that's why we're still using it that way but the I, I, swim club in the past has viewed it as their street and they did not want to give it they did not want to give it to the city right. I mean, it's a long not time ago but well the swim club the property adjacent to their west boundary line of the roadway is theirs because of law they're the adjacent owner to work with the city gave them permission if you the swim club wish to pave the street we will not stop you go ahead and do it they did the initial paving all the way up all to get where they are but since then the cost of maintaining that street has always been a question. They came to the city saying, what will you all do to help us? Now, as Craig pointed out, or Dan. Dan, we use the street because it allows you to get back to the back end of the park, which gets you through the trails and stuff and the bridge that's there is, is ours because that's our property. So yes, and it's been that way since 1947. Nobody has ever contested it. How is this different than York? York is a privately owned okay. all straight up and the trustees in their indentures fully take care of it. Now the city extends the courtesy of snow plowing it. through it That's so it. that in case of an emergency, can your trucks. vehicles can get there. Dan, have we ever done a non-dedicated street building overlaid an alley or anything that's not city property with public funds? Music, right away. Music way. Yeah, we don't maintain we or don't do anything. Do yeah, there. it's yeah. the only one that I can think of. But we the didn't. only other private ones that we don't do anything with, which are very small streets. There's Hermelin, which comes off of Litzinger, just to yep. the west of Hanley, and then there's Addy, which comes off the west side of Hanley, like near Post, and we don't do anything with those because I know they asked us to put up a sign that said Hermelin. Someone had hit it. I guess he ran off of Litzinger. I was like, I'm not doing it because one, I don't have it, and two, it's not my street. I can give you, you know, vendors who can do that for you. The alleyways behind the uh, dry cleaners and the Starbucks. Is oh, that, yeah, to the east of Brentwood. We Bullard. take care of that alleyway. Right. We take care of the alleyway at the Brazu area yeah. to work with because those are things. But they're, they're alleyways, and that's part of what that survey will hopefully tell us who's yeah. the true owner. The current arrangement is, is all documentation tells us, the true owner of this property for this street is out of business. And we've all been using it for 40, right. 50 years now, the way it is. I have a legal opinion, even though we kind of caught him off guard. I, um, but because of how good he is, <laughs> um, Kevin O'Keefe said that this would be an appropriate expenditure for a public purpose to effectuate the public's right to use the easement and not just patrons of the swim club. So now the decision is if the committee thinks if the committee agrees with the opinion. 
that it is a proper mm -hmm. yep. proper expenditure because it would not be considered as using uh, public funds to make improvement on a private, private property. property. What about the section in front of the pool? So if if that's owned by the swim club and we're going to pave that, then then we are. I don't think we're paving that. They're going yeah, to be doing. Yeah, we'd have to draw a line, you know, an imaginary line that would indicate that this is all the city's obligation. Because I agree with you, if you keep going too far north, then you're actually on their parcel. Yep. They may need to move their parking lot paving operations slightly to the west to encompass that area. I'd notify them as soon as possible. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. think they know that because I, I think they bet just their parking lot when you come off mm -hmm. the road is what right. is going to be paved. Yeah. But they, and they would love the city. Get me as far north as you could. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Dick, yeah. Well, it sounds like there's there's no feasible way to do this before the pool opens in three weeks. There isn't. So I I would I would make a motion that we use public works employees to go repair the street as much as we can for safety purposes. I will second your motion. I don't think it's viable to ask the swim club to pay for it, not just because they don't have the money, but I don't know how you'd unwind that from getting an RFP on a, a road that's already been paved. Right. Um, so that just seems tenuous. Um, and then really wait for the survey to get completed. I mean, we heard that the survey may have to go into next year uh, just because of the cost of it, but maybe we need to revisit that because I, I would also be uncomfortable with paying a lot on the street to, if we find out something weird about it too. No, I think from a safety standpoint, if the, if the, especially during the summer, we need to be able to get our trucks, fire truck or an ambulance back there. Or people walking down the street. It's really dangerous. It yeah. is. It is. Yeah. Dan, do we have access to any type of heavy-duty street roller that if you put patch and stuff in, you at least can roll some we, of that? Yeah, we rent one. We used to own one, but it became too arduous to, to keep. To keep it. Yeah. I, yeah. Would, I would include that in a reasonable effort to help get us to the point where we right. could get a bid for paving. Yeah, because we still own a pavement saw, so in my mind, stepping through it, I thought, well, we would cut out the bad section, you know, the, the cancer that's there, the mm -hmm. huge pothole. We can go get hot mix asphalt locally. West produces it, so does Fred Weber. And then we would have the roller that we would rent and recompact that area. Those Because they're kind of jumbled together. It's yep. not like the whole thing is deteriorated, but there's a, a good patch that's needed in that area. Well, we can just direct... Dan to do this as a committee it doesn't have to nope. yeah yeah so if I'm understanding correctly you want us to do the repair that we should try to accomplish before the 25th yeah and then we'll roll into the 2019 street RFP the actual bid for swim club but pick that line that actually is that ownership transition piece yes. I think, yeah I think and then we right. still have to notify the swim club that hey this is where we think our you know line is so that they understand with their paving operations what they're obligated to do before the 25th. Yeah, and then also I think we need to pull the survey of that street in to this year as quickly. Maybe that's the top priority of the... And priority. the cost of that, just based on Eric, um, some of the quotes we got, it's one of the highest, $58,000. Mm -hmm. I know, but it, it seems like that's probably the most important. Even it, even, yeah. even so the Bridgeport walkway is lower importance. I mean, it's just Bridgeport, <laughs> so who cares? But I will <laughs> caution, as Mr. Albrecht cautioned us, that may not be a good way forward. That's why he told us to back off on some of the bills that we were looking at. You have a method that's worked over all of these years. When you go to physically start doing your surveys and stuff, you may not like some of the answers or the end result versus this is the way it has steadily progressed. So he said, leaving a sleeping dog lie, may not hurt you in this case. I, you know, in the future, the city has a project. Eric, if you could come up to the yeah. dais. We have a project. Um, so back in 2016, I think, when the board had that workshop, you know, we had a lot of projects, high in the sky. So there's one project that would go through um, the swim club road. Do you want to quickly synopsis of that project? The, the street? Bridgeport thing? No. No, the, the that punches all the way to Strassner. So one of the <clears throat> one of the things that has been discussed is expanding sort of a greenway from um, from Manchester all the way through Strassner. Mm -hmm. And and so that is um, it is a uh, something that was been um, it has been developed and designed and it basically would start from 
uh, south. Uh, it, it starts south from Manchester. It, it takes basically Mary and Dorothy, combines them into one one road, expands the Greenway all the way from from that area all the way through Swim Club, all the way through the park onto um, onto um, Strassner. Uh, a couple of things it does. It actually extends White. So instead of shutting down White at um, at Dorothy, it actually extends White. So White becomes one continuous road. Um, the, the Greenway would actually go underneath right at, underneath white at that point. Uh, I, I think it, it does block off. Um, no, it doesn't block off, but it extends white. That was one of the an interesting parts of it. Uh, it gets uh, additional, I think, some greater access to the swim club. Um, so it, it is a, a conceptual design that is in place. Uh, Plain Design Studio actually just won an award for that, that design. Um, pictures in my office if you want. Yeah, so it was something that has been put together. It is, uh, it is a, it's a great design, but it's, uh, it is costly also. I was going to say, money is attached. <laughs> yeah. Now, something that, whew, I, always, I always like to shock bullet with things like this, uh, that we just learned is that MSD is also going to be doing some um, pipe work down in, in that area too in the next couple of years. So there's, uh, yeah. Opportunity. So, yeah, if there's some opportunity to work with MSD, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's something that we should be talking about here. And yeah, they okay. just brought that up about a week ago. So do we want to proceed with the paving before a survey happens? Sounds like. I would say as long as you're just milling up what's currently there and I'm going to put it down nice and smooth and not ruffle any feathers. Yeah. If stick it in the 2019 capital budget and let's get it funded so that it gets done to work with. But I hesitate with Mr. Beinbeck's and Mr. Albrecht's thing getting too deep into the weeds in this one, you may kick a sleeping dog and may not like the end result. So maybe we need to take it out of the RFP for the survey if that's 15,000 that we don't yeah. need to spend. Uh, I think we need to leave it in the survey um, until we talk to all those property owners that abut, we won't know. And it seems to me that Mr. O'Keefe now has a different opinion. So it would be good. Wouldn't you want to know before we, well, we'll we do that? that greenway, just well, yeah, yeah. his opinion is to go ahead. It's reasonable for the for city that. to do the paving. Right. Let's ask him the specific. Is it reasonable for the city to do a full survey of swim club? We've line? done other surveys of this area before, so we aren't doing something new. Okay. I... That's just my opinion. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Right. So we have a motion in the second, I believe. That we already voted on patching the, or we directed yeah, the committee to, to at least to patch do that. for now. Yes, okay, yeah. good. So. Motion right. to adjourn. Well, let's oh. citizen comment. I don't I see anybody, oppose. so yeah. I'll motion entertain. to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. And our next meeting is the second Thursday at 6 p.m.